Um, this is the design panel um, where we have a bunch of WordPress designers here today, some of which code, some of which design. Um, so we're going to really dig into processes and um, tools that we use and best practices of design. So um, I'll introduce myself first. I am a partner and creative director at Green Melon Media. Um, my team is here. We've got Mickey and Chantel. Oh, Ashley's not here. No, Ashley. <laughs> and Susanna, and um, we are, have a studio in Marietta, just right off the square. Um, let's see, I am, we do more than just web, we do branding, print design, content strategy, SEO, and social media management. We have, uh, let's see, when I'm not hanging out with these guys here, I'm hanging out with my husband and my dog in Marietta. We have Jill Anderson. Jill has been a freelancer for over 13 years. She um, works mainly with other creatives and has a passion for creating beautiful and innovative websites. She focuses on clear positioning and positive user experiences. She loves typography, code, and all things WordPress. She lives in, Atl in the Atlanta suburbs with her husband and her five-year-old son and her cat, Peanut, who is also the chief paperweight. <laughs> Tom Tortorisi, is, uh, he does design, writing, marketing, and messaging. Uh, for both web and print. He tries hard to approach things from the vision of the visitor rather than the actual designer. They're two very different things. Um, he's taught graphic design as well as strategic copywriting. At home, Tom has a wife and three cats and also a vast collection of media, communications, and computing devices from the late 1800s until now. Cliff Seal is uh, the senior UX engineer at Pardot a Salesforce company. Uh, he's passionate about keeping people at the heart of UX. He will design, code, and research to make that happen. He's, he also happens to be the resident WordPress developer. There's, there's Ashley. We will, um, and he will, uh, let's see, he also is the co-founder of multiple profitable side projects such as Evermore and Toondig. Um, and he co-organizes a uh, meetup called AMUX. Um, which is focused for local UXers. He lives uh, with his wife, April, and I believe it's her birthday today. Uh -huh. And um, he can be found, if he's around Atlanta, he can be found at a concert, cycling around the city, or playing guitar. I also have a cat. Oh, he's got a cat. Okay. <laughs> Am I the only one without a cat? Yep. We had to give my cat. <laughs> so, um, so I'm going to go through some questions and we're going to answer them. You know, not everybody is obligated to answer. We'll just kind of jump around as needed. And if you have any questions, jot them down because we'll have some Q&A time at the end. Um, and I want to make sure to get everyone's questions as we can. So we'll start with the first one. Um, why is it that you like designing for WordPress? Is it the interface? Is it the back end dashboard? Is it? Yeah. Is it going to work or not? Um, it's nice having a starting point rather than starting from scratch. Uh, it's nice um, that the more we know, the more we can do. And it's nice that there's a lot of flexibility. That's not going to right. Yeah, I don't know if that's going to work. <laughs> it's not on. Well, it's for the, it's for the video. Oh. Um, I like using WordPress just because it empowers clients to be able to update their sites, so why not use a CMS? Yeah, maybe just leave it on the table. Yeah. Just talk about it. Just give it a try. Um, yeah, and I agree. Uh, yep, please. Speak up. Okay. Mm -hmm. you guys talk a little yeah, just, yeah. If you can yeah. just shut it, that'd be great. Cool. That's actually cool. yeah. okay. a little force. <laughs> Okay, so let's talk about when we're actually working with clients. And you know, you, you sit down with a client, discovery meeting, what have you. What questions are you asking them to really get inside their brains? Uh, because design can go so many different ways, right? And just because you have a vision doesn't mean the client shares that vision. So how do you really get that out of them? Um, I start by asking about product features and competitive benefits but I ask the client to answer from their customer's point of view rather than their own internal point of view as an employee, and that kind of shifts the mindset to make them understand that the website is for customers, not for them, 
and very often the gems that come out of those conversations end up driving the direction of the website. I like to ask about goals and budget ahead of time so that we can map it to what do you want to accomplish because I really like hearing how people can actually set out business goals and try to map things together. Um, surprisingly, a lot of times you'll ask people to come up with give me one or two actual business goals for whatever you're trying to design and they struggle to come up with an actual goal, uh, which means that there's no success criteria, which means it really doesn't matter if you do a good job at all, which is tough. Um, whereas with like most people, if you can ask them a few times, be pestering on that question, you can eventually get them to map it to a specific goal, and I feel like that really then, mm -hmm. you get to focus on the visitor and you can channel it into something that helps. Yeah, I agree with Tom and Cliff, of course. I also like to ask, what's the number one uh, action you want your viewer to take. Uh, mm -hmm. You can definitely keep that in mind with the design. And that leads to a, a question about, a lot of this comes into play with messaging as well. And that's, you know, a, there's a balance between good design and good messaging and actually having that call to action somewhere where people will actually see it and act and convert. Um, so how do you see the balance of messaging and design uh, when creating a WordPress web, when creating a website? I feel like messaging really just needs to come first and also realize that there are early stage buyers who maybe don't need a lot of information, they just want the highlights, and then there are later stage buyers who want to dig a little bit deeper. So if we offer messaging starting out with early stage buyers getting um, the important messages in headlines, top of the home page, and, and that in turn kind of determines um, priority and sequence accompanying headlines and text and I think good design makes that all seamless. Mm -hmm. You made an interesting point messaging should come before design mm -hmm. um, I think so. and we always find that messaging is the biggest bottleneck in our process. In, if you rely on the client to, pre pre to present content it could take any number of months right I mean it's just impossible to really guarantee that that's going to happen quickly. Um, so working messaging in at the forefront, then that's super important. Any other thoughts, messaging, design? I, mean, I think it's important uh, when you first visit a site that it says who you are, what you do, why it matters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Getting that out there. Mm -hmm. They did a good job of critiquing that at the last panel. Um, if you guys were in that panel in the large room about uh, do you have spinach in your teeth? You know, just really the first thing that you see when you come to the website, do you know in 30 seconds exactly what you do? Um, and that's so important and it's so easy to forget if you uncover their goals and, you know, what you want that key action to be, it's important to make sure that that is at the forefront of the design through the whole process and not to forget that. Yeah. That's the whole reason you're doing this for them. That's a good point. In fact, in fact you know, your main banner headline really should get across what you do and why specifically people should be interested and, and hopefully get some keywords in. So that, that's a lot to fit into a brief headline, but that's part of the challenge. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it, it, there are a lot of, you know, companies, they've got websites from the client's point of view, they know what they, what they do, so sometimes they'll start getting into benefits, whereas somebody, an outsider, will look at it and say, okay, what do you do? Mm -hmm. You know, and um, if you really look at a lot of websites, it's not that clear. And even just putting, um, you know, what you do in the logo isn't even quite enough because if you look where your eye lands on the page, it, it, it doesn't land in the periphery. It lands a little further in. So the eye can really skip right over the logo and not even see what you do if, if, if the only place you, you have that is in the logo. Mm -hmm. So it really has to be in that first headline. Mm -hmm. Compliment design. Um, well, good. I, I'm curious what each of your web processes or what each of your design processes is. Everybody follows something different. They start from a different platform. Um, you know, what exactly do you do from the beginning of the design? I mean, and, and into development as well. If that's you know, if you go there. Right, I'll start. <laughs> uh, I do a lot less of that whole process nowadays, uh, but especially when I did and when I've run larger projects, um, I like starting with those 
let's write down business goals and let's have them so that we can always come back to them and everyone agrees to them and they're written down and they're there and they're final. And if anybody needs to change it, let's come back and make sure everybody still agrees on it before we go forward um, and kind of work out from there and get um, messaging is a big part of it. Um, but I like to say, like, we talked about knowing what the site is about very quickly. Um, so a couple of nerd stats. So. In a tenth of a second, the human brain judges what it's looking at, uh, and we've seen that in web studies, and so people are immediately kind of making a snap judgment about whether something is worthwhile, purely based on what they're taking in visually before they even start to like consume that information. Um, and then within about 10 seconds, they're usually making a decision as to whether to keep reading or not. Um, and really the goal, especially if you're selling something, especially if you're selling a tool, you want people envisioning their problem being solved with you as the solution within those 10 seconds. And then the rest of it is just captivating people. Um, so to me, most of the design process centers around getting people involved in that vision and figuring out how we can get people there. And then the rest of it kind of falls into place because to me, most of the design process is getting rid of the things that you think are important because they're actually not, uh, and helping focus on the person that you're actually selling things to. Everything else kind of falls into place eventually. There's nothing worse than when a client asks for everything to stand out. Mm -hmm. We want this to stand out, but what about the sidebar? But what about this? And you have to make sure you reinforce that the goal of the site is this main message and getting that refined. Yeah. Process. Um, I actually start with a questionnaire with my clients and I make them fill that out and then we have a kickoff call and go over everything. Um, I find that when I have clients actually write out their own feelings and ideas about things, it kind of sticks with them. Um, yeah, kind of that idea that once you state it, you know, they're going to follow that. And they think a lot more when they're writing rather than just spitting out ideas. Yeah. It's good to collect those, but when you have them in writing, it's so much more concrete to them. Yeah, and I like the part of you know, them filling out this questionnaire beforehand and then us talking about it. Uh, I get a lot from that actually talking to the client about what it is they want to achieve. That's where I start. Um, I'll approach that question in a different way, say after the um, discovery and initial selling points are determined, I'd start with the process with an outline um, with the various pages, the sections or layers on each page, and the elements in each section, and spell that all out, and then prepare all the copy, prepare the images, and then building the site, I just start from the top of the outline and start building down, and since all that prep work is done, that process actually goes pretty easy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm with you. We do, we do something similar. We always start um, prior, you know, following discovery and in our questionnaire that we do as well. Uh, we always do a site map um, outlining the navigation so that the client agrees on right then and there exactly what pages are going to be on the site. There's no surprises down the road. And that's really important is you know, making sure that things are approved as you go through. It just makes it so much easier. You don't want to get to the end and all of a sudden have so many changes to make because the client was unaware of exactly what was leading up to this design. Uh, I was just curious what tools you used to create the mock-ups or, or do that design like you were talking about. I know there's Basomic, some people use the uh, whiteboards, uh, Photoshop examples, templates. I, I actually use Illustrator for my mock-ups because I come from a print background. I find that program easier to use than Photoshop. Yeah, I start my, um, we use a program called, or a, an app called Slick Plan to do our um, sitemaps. And that's, so that's prior to wireframing. And Slick Plan is really slick. It helps you lay out exactly the hierarchy and a flow chart of what pages are on the site. And you can add little notes stating what features are gonna be on that page. So it helps you really think through the flow of the site and usability in general, because it's so important to think about usability before you know, really getting into design. Um, and then once the site map's approved, we'll do um, wireframing, and I use Illustrator as well for wireframing. I've tried balsam balsamic, balsamic, and um, I'm just handicapped in it. I'm so comfortable in Illustrator that I'm able to move things around so much quicker and more free. Um, so I default back to my programs, just because it's my comfort zone. 
Um, I don't know if you have any other wireframing tools that you use. The best tool is the one you have with you. Um, yes, paper and pen can work yeah, always. So. That'll work, or whatever <laughs> I feel like pulling up at that time. Uh, I do tend to use, at this point, I use Sketch for almost everything. Yeah. It's no better than any of the other tools. It's just, I learned it this year, so now I try to use it. <laughs> Challenge. Sure. Yeah, that's, those are my two. Those are our tools we use internally. We've floated around a little bit. I used to do site maps in Illustrator. You know, I would just draw my boxes, and, and then slip, slip plans changed my life in that way. The neat thing about slip plan is once the client approves it, you can export it as a PDF. Um, send it to them, and the notes can be little annotations in a PDF. Um, but once they approve it, you can export it right into WordPress, and it keeps that page structure for you. So that's a really nice, nice feature. And from there, um, so it'll actually create the pages based on yes. with the notes. <laughs> yeah. The notes that are in the slip plan um, that you put in there with features, those actually become the body copy on those pages, which um, you'll have to go in and obviously flush out into the more thought out you know, copy and features. Um, but it's a really good starting point and helps you get all of your thoughts in one What's the pricing on that? It's, I, we do pay for it. Um, there's yeah. a free version. Free version of a plus five. Six yeah. starting at $6.99 six a month. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and you've got a limit on the number of websites. <laughs> <laughs> they do not pay for it. I like to thank our sponsors, Slate Fan, for our design panel. Totally transparent. Analyze their website. See exactly what. Uh... Good. Yeah, there you go. Everything's up front. They do say that if you're selling services, the first thing that somebody will look at is pricing. So keep that in mind as well. Uh, I mean, if you have a service oriented web or product oriented website, Pricing is going to be the first thing they click on. If it's service oriented, they'll probably go to your about page first. So just key things to make sure are in your site map as you're going through it, and that's what you think about when you site map. You know exactly what pages need to be involved uh, in order to accomplish the goal that you define. Any other questions? Um, okay, so we talked about tools, which is actually going to be my next question. So plugins. Any plugins that make your design life easier, or there's, it's a loaded question because there's so many options. But I don't know. Design. Is there anything that you use to help you in that? Actual design, design rather than functionality. Or functionality. UX. You know, whatever. And, uh, I mean, back, you know, backup buddy for you know, um, backups. Um, search and replace can come in real handy. Mm -hmm. Simple 301 redirects can come in handy. Um, I have a couple of kind of boilerplate themes that I can start with that include major frameworks like Bootstrap and things like that. So even if I'm not building out a whole site or application in Bootstrap, to me it's very helpful just as kind of a nerd. It's easy for me to code my way to a design most of the time. Um, so yeah. I end up kind of building it that way. So with, uh, with front-end frameworks, I can easily kind of build out layouts and get a pretty high fidelity idea of how things will work and build out kind of a mock that way. Um, and so that's, yeah, that's kind of the way I can step into design and do it a little bit different. But I have a much less refined process than professionals. But a lot of people do that. They're designing in the browser now. And, you know, some, I mean, I, I fear for Photoshop in the design world, I mean, it's always going to be there for photography. Um, but so many people just design in the browser. Um, you know, there's the whole mobile first uh, approach as well, where you think about how it's going to be viewed on a mobile device before it gets to the full desktop, desktop screen. We're seeing that 50% plus of the visitors on some of our sites are mobile users now. Yeah, so it's so important to be mobile responsive and to think about how, how things are going to bend and flex on a mobile device. Um, but for plugins, yeah, I know there's, and you're going to have to help me, Mickey, um, there's one when we're designing a site you can put a coming soon. Oh yeah, there yeah, ultimate coming soon page yeah. and others, yeah. Yeah, the ultimate if it's a if it's a new site, yeah. Yeah, if it's a brand new site starting from scratch, we'll do a nice ultimate coming soon, uh, where if you're logged in, you see the site. If you're not logged in, like everybody else in the world, you're 
it's a coming soon page, which is an easy flip. I'm also using that as a maintenance right now. Okay. We're going to take down the current site for a day. There's also a maintenance Mode. option you can do on that. Good. Yeah, good job. Uh, one plugin oh, that I've used too that helps the users is uh, custom help boxes. Okay. And you can put those into the admin so that the user sees them. You can even embed YouTube videos of how to use the features of WordPress and stuff. So that's been really helpful. I've seen some things like that. A lot of questions. Custom help box, I believe. Is that right? Uh, if you do a search on that, it should come up. I can't. The title of the actual plugin that I use is a little bit longer now. I can't recall it right now. Question. Um, so on that note, I'm, I'm curious if any of the folks on the panel have done any like test-driven UX development. Mm -hmm. So maybe um, testing. And if there's any particular things that they use to kind of test whether or not certain things that they're putting out are in fact performing, you know, working the way that they expect. Yeah, we just did a deep dive into A/B testing um, plugins, and I'm not going to be able to recall any yeah, of the ones we looked that. at. There are A/B testing plugins out there that allow you to change. It's, it's more, you know, the color of the button and, you know, different, different users will see, one will see a red button, one will see a, one that blends nicely with the site, you know, and see exactly how users are reacting um, and which ones they click on and then obviously go towards the one that has a better performance. It's, it's really fairly simple. Great game. Yeah, yeah. There's also heat mapping. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with what a heat map looks like. Uh, it's... It, it, is it a plugin, Crazy Egg? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, Crazy Egg. Crazy Egg is what we've used, and it's a plugin that allows you to track where the user's clicking um, most frequently, and it uses a heat overlay um, to show the red areas are obviously where the clicks the most. That's how we're, other than analytics, it's another good way of seeing exactly how somebody navigates the site, <laughs> what they top. click on. Crazy Egg? Crazy Egg. Crazy egg. Yeah. So that's a good one. There's another one called Mouse Flow that's ridiculously full featured. Okay. Like it will take videos of people on a site and different things. It's kind of crazy. Mouse flow. Take videos mouse. of the people? Flow. Right. Like of, not of the people, of the oh, mouse. Okay. <laughs> okay. So you can, you can see like where people are doing. Watch the light on your camera, guys. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm disappointed. My wife doesn't know anything. <laughs> you said thanks, for, thanks for pointing that out. Mouse Flow. Mouse Flow. Mouse yeah. Flow. And they have a free one, too. I was going to say, another one we use sometimes, we use Studio Press for most of our themes, the Genesis framework and things like um, the Genesis Visual Hook Guide. There's a lot of hooks you can use in Genesis to just stick content places. It can be confusing sometimes if you're aware a hook is going to land and that'll just expose them all in the front of your site and label them all pretty ugly, but then you say, oh, it's going to go here. And you can use that to, to help build things out. Yeah, and I think, Russell, that was you asking that question, right? I think you were also talking about maybe testing a design before you deploy it, like making sure it's viable. Um, one really good option for everybody is called Peek, uh, P-E-K, I think it's from usertesting.com. So basically you can do one or two a month for free, but you basically just pay a stranger to go through your site and look at it and tell you, what is this site about? What do I want to click on now? I'm going to click around. I'm going to, like, just people who are trained to talk through things. It's extraordinarily helpful either for an existing site or for one where you're trying to figure out if the design is actually accomplishing what you're trying to do. Um, like I had them look through one of my sites and what I was hoping to hear was that they would look at it and know what was going on. And I said they were kind of like, eh, I don't really, I don't care. So I'm going to click around and I don't really know what's going on. Uh, and it was very helpful feedback, right? And you can get it from multiple people so you can kind of get the concept of what it's like to have somebody coming there who has no motivation to tell you what you want to hear, uh, but instead gives you really honest feedback. It's a really helpful way to kind of point out some issues that you might have. What was this called? Peak. P -E -E -K mm -hmm. dot user testing dot com. There you go. Mm -hmm. Even at like user testing dot com, you can just go and like upload a, a, um, like a JPEG, like a screenshot of your homepage, and you just ask people like, "It's for free. You can just do some tests. You get a free one. You just ask people like, what is this site about? Yep. And see if they can figure it out quickly. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really useful for making sure your main message is coming across quickly. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I like that. It's not that much. Any other? Yeah, Russell. Yeah, I have, a, I have kind of a different question specifically for Cliff. Um, so, like, I'm noticing this kind of change from home pages with sliders on them and all this craziness above the fold to 
power you see up in front of you, which Cliff, by the way, did a bang up job with the working at the Atlanta site. What is this more marquee image kind of above the fold and like kind of a more still home page? And you see this kind of trend where there's like a button in the middle and this big image. Can you just talk about that kind of specific kind of trend in web developments and kind of where we're going with that and, and why maybe? Yeah, so uh, I think in general the move from, you know, because sliders have now been replaced with ridiculously huge images all over your home page, so it's a new fad in a different day. Um, the intention, I think, in getting there is what we were mentioning earlier about being able to quickly parse what a website is about. So images can tell you a lot more subconsciously, uh, much more quickly. And so the big image is more about setting context that you don't really have time to read. Uh, so if it's done correctly, um, an image can tell you how something should feel or how you should feel about it or kind of how you should approach what you're about to read. Specifically with this website, like one of the things that I wanted to do with this banner image, which I made, um, was to kind of set an idea for people, especially who hadn't been at WordCamp before or were, who, were, who were worried that it was very developer-centric, to try to give basically a non-text way of saying it's not all about that. It's a little bit more casual. Um, you can kind of bring whatever tools you have with you. It's not all about code. Um, and so even though we could do that in copy, in theory, like using a powerful image one way or another is kind of a helpful way to push people in the right direction. Um, and so I think it's also very impactful for websites that are not like this when you see people's faces or you see them doing something uh, on a good website it's it's making you feel a certain way before you start reading the copy and figuring out what you're interested in but, uh, does that counter what he was saying or what you were discussing earlier about the get the messaging I mean this messaging action Headline. A headline. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. A headline or yeah. We're yeah, on the you, same wave. Whatever your main message is, you know, it should be the f first thing they say. You know, the so kind of you know what you do and what sets you apart. <clears throat> with the, what I find with the big visuals, are yes, it's setting a tone and a feeling, but I'm not sure yet where we're going, what it's about. I mean, it's just setting the tone. Mm -hmm. well, so. Yeah. I think it's the combination. If those are in yeah. conflict. If those are conflicting well, views. You, you know, know, I mean, I mean, if you first look at the banner, you can't tell either, you know, what the company does or why they why they do it differently, why they stand out. Then basically, you know, we haven't accomplished what we're supposed That's to. One way or another. Right? Yeah. yeah. Just combining the two, like a nice large image with text mm -hmm. on top of it. Right. Right. Yeah, I don't think those are in conflict at all. Okay. It's just one's, one's a subtle way to get to your messaging a little bit more quickly, hopefully. But like, if you do either one of those wrong, you kind of mess up the messaging totally. <laughs> um, which is why stock imagery and things like that is difficult because if you've got if you've got great messaging and then like four business guys high fiving, <laughs> like oh, you, you know, right? It's such a weird tone. Um, and so yeah, I, I don't think they're in conflict at all. They go together. Okay. One thing um, Cliff had, had mentioned um, big big banner images and yeah I mean they're great they're impactful but something I uh, mentioned yesterday that I'd really still like to see a little bit of the content underneath peeking out and it's kind of a visual cue to keep scrolling um, otherwise people see that banner image and they might not be sure well maybe there's something else maybe I'll just click the back button I don't know you know it's it's a you know very very quick decision. So that's something to keep in mind, too. Um, let me go with her first, because she just had her hand. Okay. Um, in a way, we've got the logo here. We understand it's WordCamp, and et cetera. But for SEO, do you, would you label the image in some way for it to be searched? Or um, where else do we have, you know, if you want to get the message in, Easy if you've got it in the image, then you've got to have it someplace else. Mm -hmm. so don't use this as, as an example for yeah. what you should do. Um, this is uh, an exception, right? Everyone who's coming to WordCamp already knows that they're coming to WordCamp. So I had a lot of freedom in not having to convince anyone to come right. to WordCamp. We sold out tickets in like <laughs> seven seconds, right? So yeah, so don't use this as an example. 
<laughs> You're right. Good point. Well, I when we were doing the um, websites the other day, yeah. the fast. You know, the one guy had his logo. The information about bass fishing and stuff was in the logo. Well, it didn't show up in the Firefox browser. Right. So he really, I told him, he needed to get that message yeah. in live the text. copy before the photo. Right. right. Yeah, it's important to do cross-browser testing. Um, you know, anybody who, once you get the, the website programmed to a point where it's in testing mode, test it in IE, Firefox, Chrome, Safari, Opera, you know, just keep on testing it and making sure it's mobile responsive and reacting the way it should. It might have been the internet, too. Yeah, it might have been. <laughs> yeah. As far as SEO attached to images, whenever you load in an image into the media gallery, you can also uh, put the title there. Right. Yeah, you can see the titles actually the popping up. And, and, and that's up there. by the SEO as well. Okay. Let me go with him real quick, just because you were Just, um, we do a lot of seniors and people who are not very internet savvy. And his design going towards large, clear buttons, and very simplistic layouts, is that one, is that here to stay? And two, are there best practices and guidelines according to like eight, you know, American Disabilities Act and people who have vision trouble to, to access websites? Are, are there, is there any sort of information out there? Is there people thinking about that, um, knowing that seniors and boomers are such a large? It's a real side. good question, but it might be a little bit too specific yeah. for you know, what we're talking did about go, today. Did you go we'll to the so. session about accessibility? missed it. So. <laughs> it was a good talk. I mean, certainly uh, tool tips because a blind person, the website can be read to them. And if there's no titles on the images, then the image is just blank. Um, you know, same with Google. Google can't read an image, but it can read the text that's associated with the image. So properly naming your images. Um, there's a title when you upload that image. You just make sure you get it in there. And it's, it's hard to always think about it because you're going a mile a minute throwing images up and resizing them. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's a good thing to double check. Uh, it's just real quick. I, uh, I'm a Mac user, and uh, I we're talking about cross browser, <laughs> cross browser uh, yeah. testing, and uh, I haven't been able to test on Internet Explorer a long time. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is there like a tool for Mac that you can use? To test I use uh, browser stack. Yeah. 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 That's right. I, do. <laughs> I use browser Hangouts browser. to Mickey. Browser yeah. stack. Yeah. Browser <laughs> stack. stack. Browser really stack. Does. Yeah. Is it is it ietester.com that'll give you all the the, the version the downloads? You can do a, a remote desktop or whatever. Well, with IE tester you can download for Windows. I know that will let you test old versions, but I'm not sure. That doesn't really help Mac users. <laughs> no, you can get the, you can you maybe got a remote one. You can yeah. get a um, I can use a virtual machine. virtual machine. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe you should explain that because it's a lot of it. Right. Oh, so like you can download a virtual machine that will run on your computer and it's just like a Windows computer in its own little thing. And I think IE Tester gives you all the packages. So you don't have to spend money on Windows. Right. Um, also, don't try what they're talking about unless you have a pretty modern computer because that's basically downloading and running a computer inside your computer. And if your existing computer can't run the computer that's there, it certainly can't run two at the same time. <laughs> oh, I was waiting for one more computer. I think you said it eight times. We were almost there. <laughs> <laughs> but interrupted me. But if, you can, but if you can, check out Parallels. I think that's what I use at home, Parallels for the Mac. If you can Parallels. run it. You can get parallels from Mac and then go to and get the free IE, free Windows thing that he was talking about and yeah. smash those together. You got a peanut butter and jelly sandwich for you. It's a bit of a of a resources drain, but and at one point browser test IE tester would give you browser stack for three months for free. Okay. So that's useful too. I think yeah. It's kind of less of an issue though, like WordPress and like the frameworks that we use. Like it sounds bad, but like I, you know, I probably launch websites without even browser testing, just because like I know the framework works. I know, you know, the, the sites we're using work and get WordPress, and so you know, I'm just used to it working everywhere. Right, right. If you're an IE, it's your own problem. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're killing it anyway. So. They're killing it. Yeah. We're changing the name. Also sponsored by Microsoft. Mobile test dot me is a good one for checking little mobile devices and how everything Yeah. Ashley, what is the plugin that we use in Chrome for viewing at different resolutions? And uh, I think it's called View Resizer. View Resizer. It's a, plug it's a uh, Google Chrome extension. 
Yeah. Yeah. I don't think it's on here. It's in. Oh, it is on here. Is that it? Yeah. It's a Chrome. Yeah, it's that one. Yeah. I think it's that. If we get to test or something. That has to reload the site, so oh. the Wi-Fi holds up. We'll see. Oh. <laughs> There's also ResponsiveTest.net, which will test it all in a different response. Good. ResponsiveTest.net. Okay. Yeah, there's, yeah. There we tools go. has a lot of, so a lot of it. Studio this, little, this little extension up here that Ashley just had the name of and I've already lost it. Uh, Viewport re Resizer. I can click each resolution and get it all the way down. <laughs> and that is mobile All right, now, now we're in this. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's your site. I actually have every one of your sites pulled up. I could have, uh, it could have been any one of you. <laughs> well, one other thing to keep in mind is not only different browser widths, but also different browser depths. Um, a full banner uh, image that looks great on a desktop might get cut off halfway in a laptop, especially if you've got several tool, um, toolbars open. So you've got to consider that too. And then you won't see the content that you're talking about. Right? You might not see even the entire banner. Or like the problem we had with this site where we added too many menu items on accident and the expanded menu overflowed the height of a normal mobile browser and then disabled you from being able to do anything else. <laughs> So yeah, that's a, that's a good thing to yeah, test for. The top in black? Yeah, like when you when it was in mobile and you expand the menu and it dropped down. Oh, oh, oh. So there were like 47 things in there one time and uh, it was impossible to get to any of them because you couldn't scroll. But it was, yeah, it was good. There's tons of pop-ups that do that so wrong and you're just like, okay, I'm closing the browser. <laughs> can't do anything. Yeah, let me get Jason. Yeah. Hi. Um, Two-part question because I just thought of another question. But are you seeing any kind of trends for navigation, such as sticky headers, and, or any other kind of navigation trends that you might see, um, you know, for both mobile and for desktop? And then we just touched on it. The below the fold myth is that a myth? Do you how much weight do you put into that? I've read from people much smarter than me that below the fold doesn't really matter because we kind of train you to scroll vertically from mobile devices and whatnot. I have a lot of fines to say everything needs to be above the fold, but it really it's hard to do when there's so many different device sizes and screen sizes. I want to hear what your opinions are on that. People do scroll, but I, I think probably the most important factor there is to have such a killer headline initial ba banner image is that you make them want to look more. Um, and I mean, yes. You know, people, you know, will scroll if you if you engage them, and if your banner doesn't take up your full depth. Yeah, I think my response would be, people are naturally scrolling so much more now because of mobile devices, and they're just used to that motion, um, so they're getting trained to scroll. Um, so it's becoming less of an issue um, with the above the fold. It's about training our clients that yeah. that's no longer quite as the valid. Fold is dead, right? Mm -hmm. The fold is dead. Like, where is the fold? You can't, right. you cannot right. determine what that's going to be like with oh. all the devices out there. Right. But having said that, still, items above the fold have more visibility. I mean, they course. just do. There, it's, still, it's still a consideration. Uh, but the Green Melon site alone, our, our website alone, has over a thousand different resolutions um, that view our site. Last year, yeah. Yeah, and so it's, it's difficult to actually define where that line is anymore. But of course, the top, you know, the header area is going to get the most eye traffic. Right, and and I even think that at this point we're probably more used to scrolling than doing a lot of clicking, mm -hmm. which brings up another issue that I've thought about um, lately is um, we set up all our um, navigation menu items, drop down um, menu items, all nice and neat. But when you go to a site, how many of those do you really click? You know, so I'm, th I'm thinking that, well, one thing, well, actually, one um, statistic I read that um, um, number of pages per visit is like 1.3 or 2.5, which, which is terrible. Um, so I'm thinking that you really need to include uh, um, promotion for the, your important pages right on your home page. So as people scroll, have a teaser, maybe a headline, a visual to point out your most important pages because we really can't depend on people going through our top navigation. We've got to promote those more important pages not only to get more page views and draw the visitor in but for the sake of 
analytics to get more uh, page views per visit. And you know how I approach that? Because um, I think about that during wireframing. Um, kind of see it as a puzzle. And I, I look at the site map, which has already been approved. And I think about what the most important messaging pieces are. And I lay them out, uh, whether I whiteboard it or I just write it in my sketchbook. And those become my puzzle pieces. And it's all about getting them to assemble in a way where there's a hierarchy of importance um, from header you know, throughout the copy. And that's the, um, you know, that's, I then present several different wireframe options, two, three, uh, with the puzzle arranged in a different way. And that's where you can maybe do some of that user testing as well. You know, like, where are we, are we really taking in what the site's about at that point? Um, yes. So since we're talking about menus and navigation, I'm curious if you guys have any tips partially from design, partially from coding perspective, for setting up menus so that they're expandable by the client. Because we'll run into that a lot where the menu, you know, looks perfect with X number of menu items, mm -hmm. but then when they want to go add two or three more, it kind of breaks the design and the flow of the site. I did not have an answer to that. <laughs> How about the yeah. Are we going to turn off the menu feature now as well on the back end? <laughs> I mean, I, okay, well, what, what, what solutions have two different layers of, um, of uh, nav menus, and one could be products, and others could be, you know, website features? Oh, it can be a custom in the sidebar, too. Um, one of the things that we've been using is the mega menus, where you hover over one, and then you've got tons of space, and you can also create different columns. One of the sites that I did recently had six different columns that you can put the links, product links in, so you've got tons of space yeah. there. I think now, it's an example of a keep in mind work. that if they only use the first two columns, then there's going to be a, a lot of more white space there, but I mean, it's something that and kind of got to nail down in the site map. Exactly. How many links I think it's also about educating the client that they don't need that many choices. You know, like, I like to tell my clients, like, please no more than seven items. And right. even seven is a lot. Right. Uh, that's why we cite that first. Yeah. Well, which also brings up in mobile the little hamburger icon, which is a solution for designers and developers, but it's a terrible idea for users because it basically buries your con <laughs> all your <Stop>. content. <laughs> I don't know what the solution is. I'm just you know, griping about it. Yeah, and, and they're, they, what they're saying is having the word menu rather than the hamburger icon is uh, usably better, because it's pretty clear what that is. Didn't they test that, though, and say it didn't matter? Well, that's no. I one blog post. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, think about it this way. I've never seen a test in which the word menu didn't perform as well or better than the hamburger icon. So you'll see sense. now like a lot of new sites that are being designed and published are moving away from it. They're adding the word menu to an icon. Uh, they're replacing it, they're changing the icon to make a little bit more sense. Like people are moving away from that icon in general. It's a helpful thing, but Facebook app is done now. They've moved away from this now wording putting words next to yeah. the icons. And they're the people who started it too. <laughs> Facebook started that fad and then they stopped doing it. What the hamburger? Yeah. Brad had a yeah, question. It wasn't the one. What do you think the biggest UX problem we have to deal with today is? too much content. There's a balance between, and this is off the top of my head, but there's a balance between SEO copy and, and having a copy heavy site that has keywords in there, you know, 350 words per page plus to get Google to understand what that page is about, and a tasteful, light, white spaced design. So finding that balance is, is tricky, and I think it's a challenge with you know, as copywriters come in wanting to really stuff those keywords in there to get rankings versus the designer who wants it to be clean and succinct. Of course, that uh, question in another way, um, when people come to your home page, they have a nice home page experience. But if the first page they land on is an internal page, you know, a, a, a plain WordPress text page is not very inviting. So my, my thinking these days is that all your major product pages or landing pages should be set up like home pages. Mm -hmm. And I'm not a coder, but I, it's why I use um, a Divi, a page builder theme. It's pretty easy to create one home page 
duplicate it, swap out the, the copy, and now I've got a, a nice home page look for all my major, major product pages, much richer experience, not only for people who come into that page for us, but, but for anybody. Um, you know, a, like I said, a plain text page just is not pretty and not inviting. Getting back to the mega menu, I have not used it yet. I haven't had a need, but uh, with my clients. But how does that work on a mobile? When I mean, it, 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 it consolidates into a hierarchy mm -hmm. instead of a. Yeah. One of the, uh, the Doesn't it just totally there. obliterate the site behind? I mean, do you show well, if you have a plugin like WP Touch, it'll mm -hmm. take the main menu items and list only the main menu items. Yeah, you could have like the sub menu collapse, and when you tap on it, then it so explain again why. What is the advantage to the mega menu? Sorry about the hamburger. You can hover over it and get a lot more detailed links. You don't have okay. to do as many click throughs to get to what you want. Yeah, that's more power. for like power users and people where you like know exactly what they're looking for. Okay. And you want to see a lot of more of the details as opposed to a general. Right, where it's just a drop down and it's just a word or three words. Right. The so mega yeah, our, our mega menu expands out into a hierarchy um, rather than, you know, trying to break and blow out left and right. Um, so, I mean, and we use a plugin called Uber Menu for our mega menus. Uber Menu, and um, it performs pretty well on, you know, just you, got, you have to tweak it obviously to get it visually how you want it. But um, I, I want to go back to Brad's question. Um, he asked about big UX problems that we're facing. So. My, my day job is with a huge software company, so I design software for people who pay for it um, or who pay for access. Um, but websites or software, to me, the, the biggest issue is as designers, we have an entire, we have entirely failed to communicate to other people what our job is, why it is important, how to empathize with people, how to understand their perspective. Like, so nerding for just a second, there's a thing called the illusion of explanatory depth that people have, which it's this. They see websites and so basically they feel like they know how to create a website that will do what they're trying to do, right? It's sort of, people figured this out because they asked people who ride bicycles if they can explain how a bicycle worked and people started to because they thought that they could and then they realized they had no idea. This is what people do with websites, right? And so the, but the problem is most of the way that we come in and try to convince people as designers that they're wrong is by just being like, you're wrong. <laughs> also, I'm right. Um, right. Um, and and we kind of, we take this perspective of like, you don't really understand where I'm coming from, ergo, I'm not going to listen to you, you should listen to me, and whatever, and it becomes contentious. Mm -hmm. And that's one way to do it, but it's much better when you learn how to communicate with people why you're doing what you're doing, because they will give you insights that you don't have. And the reason you don't have those insights is because you're not building a level of communication with people so that they can be honest and try to figure out how to talk. And so like as designers, like it's the, it's the communication gap between what we do and the people that we're working with to accomplish something. Like we failed at that horribly. The internet is full of designers being jerks about clients and about the people that they're designing for. And it's funny sometimes, but there's very few people working on actually making the communication happen. So do you think you do that through users? Uh, Does that solve the problem for I, strangers? I do that by not being a jerk. Um, <laughs> quite honestly, like I have to work on it. I have to not be a jerk when I say stuff, and I have to work on communicating with people and letting them be comfortable asking questions and setting a context where they feel comfortable talking about things that they don't understand. I, I think that's like the biggest component of it. It's just taking that approach when you talk. We're running out of time. There's actually a good book about that by Mike Montero, Design the Job, mm -hmm. one of the book of parts. Where's the book? Cliff's going to write. Cliff's going to write. Cliff's going to write. The second one's really about that design as a job. I haven't read his second one, but it's really about like. You're my favorite one. Yeah. 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 That, that one's good too, but it's more, <laughs> it's less from like what you do as a designer. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's about sales. What's the name of the book? We were having a hard time. Design is a job. One of the book of parts. Because otherwise, Cliff, you need to do a session about modeling. You know, like 
one of us can pretend to be the client and then you tell us how we should talk to them? Oh, this is and it's yeah. about, it's, it's doing research and knowing the statistics. There's so many times where the client turns to you and says, well, what do you think? You know, and you can say, well, visually, we like this. But there can be statistics. There's data behind why it's better. So knowing that information in order to communicate it to the client gives, you know, validi validity to the conversation. Like when you, you when you're clients, you you question what you did. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, I think uh, I think we're we need to wrap up here. Uh, we're they're going to want to start coming in for the next session. So real quick, tell us each where we can find you online, and I'll go to your sites as you go through. Jill. Jillindesign.com. Okay. Tom. Tortoriseinc.com. Cliff? Uh, just Google Cliff Seal. I'm the only one. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of Alley Green. Yeah. And Green Melon Media is us. So thanks, guys, so much. Thank you.